let me pass the baton to Manuel Adelino presenting the second paper in the session. Okay, so let me get started. Thank you very much. So this paper is joint with Yvonne and, and Michael who are both at the Fed. So these are not the, the views of the Fed, obviously. The usual disclaimer applies. Um, I have to say, um, Jose, and I, that doesn't limit in any way the possibility that you say, you know, that you destroy the paper later, but I, I, I was extremely excited to know who the discussant was gonna be. So I'm very much looking forward to the comments that Jose has. The paper is preliminary and we, we know we, we have more work to do. Well, let me, let me tell you what the paper does right now. So um, what we wanna do is um, think um, again, like uh, the banking literature has for a very long time, about the type of information that the banking sector relies on to make decisions. And of course, um, th this, this has been there for a long time and in a recent, recent survey article, let's say, um, and Mitch sort of lay out um, what, how one should think about uh, hard information and soft information. So hard information being that information that you can easily codify and soft information is information that is harder to transmit, harder to codify, and how both kinds play into um, lending decisions. And, pricing decisions, which is something that we're going to be looking at in our paper. Um, so there, there have been um, very sustained advances in, in information technology um, recently. And um, I think a lot of the motivation for us to look at this is to see how big banks um, are acting right now. Uh, that's, that's how I would think about what we're doing is a snapshot of how big banks are pricing loans right now. We know that fintech lenders are capturing market share in a number of markets. The mortgage market is one that is that is that is affected tremendously, uh, but a lot of a lot of lending to households, like credit card lending, is also largely done in an automated way. Um, and so, we our setting is not going to be one of households. What we're going to do is we're going to try to say something about the relative importance of hard and soft information in corporate loan pricing. That's what we want to do in this paper. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use um, a comprehensive loan level data set that the Federal Reserve gathers for their stress testing activities. And um, what, that, what that information, what, what, the, what those data include that are crucial for what we want is they have banks model-based assessments of probabilities of default. So think of this as credit models. They have the internal hard information-based models that spit out a probability of default. Then you can then modify to construct a rating. So we also have that. And then we have the loan interest rates, we have borrower financials, and we have a number of loan outcomes. Um, and we have a number of loan outcomes. In particular, we're gonna be interested in delinquency, right? People that are not able to, uh, or like companies that do not make um, all of their payments. Now, these data are only gonna be for the largest US banks, the ones that are subject to the stress tests but they do account for a very large percentage of all commercial loans in the US, in particular commercial loans that stay on banks' portfolios. And also importantly, this paper is about pricing. This paper is not about um, loan applications and decisions to accept or reject a loan. And that, that is important, okay? So we're not gonna have anything to say about the extent to which hard or soft information matter for the lending decision itself. We're going to focus on what on 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 the pricing on the pricing of these loans. Okay, so um, we measure hard information using the bank's internal model-based um, probability of default. We've also used loan loss given default. We also have that information that's not in the paper right now. That may be something to bring back. Now the U.S. implementation of Basel II requires banks to compute these model-based estimates. Um, when they when they when they give out loans, and the advantage of these is that this is going to give us a standardized measure of default risk that we're going to be able to compare across banks. Importantly, though, all of our analysis is going to include a bank by time fixed effect. So, to the extent that these models are different bank to bank, we are going to be able to um, include a bank by time fixed effect when we do our analysis. Give me just one second. I'm sorry. Sorry about that, the kids were running around. Um, 
So th these probabilities of default are also meant to sort of give you a, um, through the cycle, um, through the cycle estimates for a wide range of economic conditions and our, we're not gonna have a long enough time series to be able to say much about that. And at the same time, we're gonna then use interest rates as the summary metric for all information that's gonna be used to produce a price, okay? So the idea over here is I'm gonna have a model-based probability of default. That model-based probability of default is going to have um, that model based probability of default is going to be based on hard information. And then we're going to have interest rates that are going to account for any other factors that are used to produce, to produce an interest rate. Um, what we find in our paper is the following bank loan interest rates. So, first, on average, bank loan interest rates track probabilities of default very, very closely. So I'm going to show you that on average, essentially they lie on a line, okay? Bank loan interest rates and probabilities of default are just linearly related. Well, with the log probability of default are, are linearly related. There's a ton of information left though. There's a ton of variation left. And so then the question is, how does the variation in excess of what the internal models um, suggest how much information is there in saying anything that is credit relevant? Um, what we find is that the variation in interest rates in excess of what the internal model suggests provides very limited information for predicting loan default. And so in the end, what we're finding in this paper is that in bank corporate lending by these very large banks in the US, hard information accounts for essentially all of the credit relevant information if what you want to do is predict default or predict negative sales, which is what we're doing in this paper, okay? So essentially these large banks, for the purposes of pricing corporate loans, are acting as fintech lenders, at least in, 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 for these kinds of outcomes that we're looking at, which are the credit relevant outcomes, okay? Now, again, what, are, what is the data that we're using for the paper? Um, our loan level data comes from the Federal Reserve Y14K Q collection. Starts in 2012. It's, these data are produced for the, for the purposes of, of creating the stress tests. We have quarterly loan level data on the corporate loan portfolios for all of the loans above a million dollars, okay? We're gonna aggregate all of this loan level information at the bank by firm by year level. And that's gonna give us 140,000 bank by firm by year observations. Because we have the bank by firm by year, we're gonna be able to put a, a bunch of fixed effects to account for a lot, of, a, a lot of unobservables. And then we have bank holding company specific information from, from other standard data sources. So, um, I don't think the summary statistics are where we want to spend any time today, but the firms in our sample are considerably smaller than the firms in CompuStat. We have firms that have, you know, at, at the median are $21 million firms in terms of assets. Um, and so, you know, the sales growth, I don't know, about 4%. Uh, and so the average firm in our sample has grown at a moderate pace um, during this sample period that I think l largely lines up with what you would find from other sources. Um, there's a lot of variation in interest rates and in probabilities of default, and this is going to be important. So we don't only have very good, very good um, credits in our sample. This is going to range anywhere from, um, you know, if you look at the 25th percentile in the probabilities of default, it's about 0.3% in, in terms of the estimated probability of default um, over the subsequent 12 months, all the way to 1.6%. And so the average risk rating that you should have in mind is something like a double B if you compare this to, um, to default estimates from, um, from rating agencies, okay? So there's, there's a lot of variation, pardon me, there's a lot of variation in the credit quality of the firms that are included in this sample. Um, let me just move this here. Um, so this is the first, the first uh, you know, quote unquote finding, something that is perhaps not surprising, but it still struck us as, 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 um, as quite interesting. And that is, when you look at what I have on the y-axis over here is the percent annual interest rate that is charged. What I have on the x-axis is the log probability of default. 
Um, you, can, you can residualize everything with respect to bank by year and you get very similar results. And what you see over here is that if you bin people, these are 50 bins, if you bin, um, if you bin the data, what you will see is that there's a very clean and linear relationship between interest rates and log probabilities of default. You see what you're seeing in gray is the 25th and 75th percentiles of interest rates in each bin. So you see that there's considerable, considerable variation around this average, but interest rates and probabilities of default line up very closely together, okay? The next step of what we wanna ask is, so notice what this is telling you is if you were only interested in that red line and the blue dots, it seems like this is produced by a model. Essentially, you have a model that delivers a probability of default. That's gonna spit out an interest rate. There doesn't seem to be any additional inputs. And in, 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 once, you have, once you have your model-based probability of default, that's gonna, that's gonna line up exactly with an, with an interest rate. The thing is, of course, there's a lot of variation around there. And so now the question that we wanna ask in our regressions is, does that variation that you see in gray does that help you predict? So if let's say that now you have a, you know, your log probability of default is two, but the interest rate that you see is either higher or lower than that. So you see that the bank, despite a model-based probability of default of a certain amount, let's say half a percent, in fact, charge a higher interest rate or charge a lower interest rate. The question is, does the deviation from the credit model give you additional information for trying to predict what will happen to that loan. Why is that interesting? Well, because that suggests that even though the model produced a given number, loan officers decided to charge a higher or a lower interest rate because they have additional information that is not encoded in that probability of default. And the question is, is that additional information useful for credit relevant events? Okay. This is what we're gonna do with these, with these regressions. We're gonna to try to do that within bank and year. That's this term over there, the alpha BT. We're gonna to try to also do that. Um, we're gonna to try to do that within county and year. We're gonna to try to do that controlling for firm um, and, and loan um, characteristics. So we're gonna ask when there are changes in the probability default or changes in the interest rate, does that help which one so this is a horse race. Where does the information come from that helps me predict loan outcome, which in this case is gonna be what we are gonna show you here. What I'm gonna show you here is loan delinquency, but we also include in the paper results with negative sales growth, okay? So again, the question to, to keep in your mind is, does that variation around this line, this is the most intuitive way to think about it is, even though the model gave me a number, does the variation around that help me predict firm level outcomes? Okay, because that suggests that the loan officers producing the interest rates have additional information that is not in that model. Okay. Probabilities of default are hard, model-based. Loan interest rates are gonna impound the bank's information. Now, let me, let me say one thing that is important because uh, I think that sometimes creates a little bit of confusion. Does all of that excess variation have to be only soft information? No, it could be soft and other sources of hard information. So if anything, we are going to give you an upper bound for how much soft information could matter, okay? That is impounded in interest rates, but is not in the model, okay? We're going to have these fixed effects that flexibly controlled for the unobserved time varying shocks. Again, we estimated within the banking year, to, to make sure that we have the same model that is within that bank and year. And then we have industry year and county year fixed effects, okay, to capture any time varying um, economic condition. So the findings that we have is that the probability of default, a one standard deviation move in the probability of default is associated with a one percentage point higher delinquency rate, whereas variation in the interest rates, a one standard deviation change in the interest rates is still significantly related, is still significantly related with delinquency. So in these first two columns, 
what you see is that probability of default is not a sufficient statistic. That's another way to think about this is, is the probability of default a sufficient statistic for predicting delinquency? You see that in column three, not quite. There is still information that comes from variation in interest rate in excess of what is there for probability of default. We see that that is true even when we add county by year fixed effects and when we add all of the controls, but you see that statistically, variation in interest rates is losing, is losing um, its predictive ability. Whereas for the probability of default, in some sense, all, all that number is saying is the credit models work. So it's not surprising that variations in the probability of default help you predict interest rates. That's what you would expect. That's what the credit model is designed to do. What this is telling you is there's a little bit of information in interest rates in excess of that, but not much, okay? So in additional tests, we have both tests in levels. We also have tests where we focus on renegotiations. So moments when the interest rates actually change to make sure that none of this is driven by stale interest rates that were contracted a long time ago. And this gives you an, an ROC analysis. This is just trying to tell you the red is the model that just has the interest rate. And what we're trying to predict over here again is delinquency. The thing to keep in mind from this picture is simply that the blue line, which only includes the probability of default when you're trying to predict um, um, defaults, actual defaults, is right on top of the green line. So I gain very, very little in predictive power by adding interest rate to my model. Once I have my probability of default, I don't do better in predicting default by adding interest rates, okay? Um, I wanna, in the last couple of minutes that I have, tell you about the effect heterogeneity. And here we wanna look at, like many people have in the literature, look at the largest banks and large banks now, we don't really have anything to say in our paper about small banks. We don't have small banks. Remember that these are banks that are subject to, um, these are banks that are subject to the stress tests. So all we can do here is split the sample into the mega banks, the largest banks in the US and the rest with, with the $250 billion split. And then we look at firms and in firms we have much more variation. So here we're going to look in, at smaller and larger firms. And then in the paper, we have also public and private firms. Okay. So we're going to look at the heterogeneity along the two dimensions that we have available. The first is, and again, small banks, I shouldn't have written small banks. These are really large banks, but are small in the sample, but they're still pretty large. And then we have the very largest banks. We do see some, some differences. And in particular for the very largest banks in our sample, Adding interest rates doesn't, tell, doesn't add at all in terms of trying to predict default. All of the information is in their model. So this tells us that they, in their pricing, all of the credit relevant information is in the models. Nothing is there in terms of potential soft information that could be impounded into interest rates. And then when we look at firms, we again see, so we see that generally the models are do worse at predicting defaults for smaller firms than for larger firms. But for larger firms, there seems to be some measure of soft information that still somewhat matters. Whereas for the very smallest firms, it doesn't look like these banks. And again, it is important that we're looking at these largest banks. They don't seem to have um, soft information that is included in interest rates that helps us predict default for these smallest firms. Okay. So let me conclude because I think I have about one minute left. Um, what we do is we use a large, a sample of the largest bank holding companies in the U S and we show that the vast majority of credit relevant information that they include in prices is hard information. This is especially true for large and for publicly traded borrowers. It applies to the whole sample of banks, but even more so to the, to the largest. Um, the move into fully automated lending and consumer credit is basically what is well underway is almost complete in some segments. What we're showing you is that in, for, for the purposes of pricing 
And for the credit relevant information and prices of corporate loans, it seems to basically all be model based or virtually all of it. Um, and so for the purposes of pricing corporate loans, the banks themselves seem to be primarily acting as technology based um, intermediaries. So I'll stop there and I look forward to the comments. Yes, thank you very much, Manuel. And uh, please, Jose, you have 15 minutes for your discussion. Thank you very, mu very much, Michal, for inviting me to discuss the paper. I think Manuel was too nice. He said that he's happy I didn't discuss in the paper. I think Mitchell should be discussing the paper. Uh, but uh, let me give you, so let me tell you what, like the very big picture of the paper first, what I think about the paper, and I think some of the struggles that the paper may have, and I would like the paper to be broader. And so, so far it looks like a very banking paper. Okay? And we need to start thinking maybe what, maybe in a, like in a broader way, okay? So let me tell you the, like, the, like the very big picture, how I see it, okay? So it has been very well documented in the literature that finance professionals in any sort, they collect and produce information and they use it, this information in very different specific organizational settings. What Manuel and the co-authors are trying to do is, to be honest, trying to enter into the organizational design, is trying to understand, well, these are very important questions in the theory of the firm. He concentrates on this second one, okay? And this, what type of information individuals use in their decisions, okay? And let me write one thing. Sorry, yeah, there. So they concentrate on this one. Yes, but remember one very important thing is, is information production, in this case, loan officers, maybe due to individuals or is the information with the organization, okay? All these questions that many people have tried to study have been very difficult to study empirically. Why? This is one of the problems that all these papers have. And Manuel is going to have, Manuel and the quarters are going to have uh, like two sets of problems. One, you don't have service of information. So if information is going to be a conjecture, it's going to be inferred from the residual of an interest rate. And most importantly, he said it very carefully, I think it was like 13, 14, he said, you don't observe the whole information set. Maybe there is outside hard information. So this is this unobservable. So you have two things that are unobserved. You have the soft information that you don't observe, and maybe the loan officer also what, has other hard information. So the paper focuses on the information corporate of the information content of corporate loan pricing. So this is one thing that has bothered me in all the paper. Why pricing? Why we have to start thinking only about pricing? I want you to set up your ideas. These are huge banks with big borrowers. Okay? Is soft information where it matters, the interest rate? So there has all these, if you see all the literature on soft information, soft information has a lot of impacts on availability of credit. So why do we care about what? I see, why do we start thinking about, this is not one loan. Here you're talking about a maybe 200 million credit facility approval. Okay, so these are the things we are going, I'm going to try to talk about. So why only the pricing dimension? This has always been what? Since I received the paper, I started thinking, is this the right setup to try to understand soft information? Okay, so what they try to do is big picture. They, peer, they try to pierce the black box of corporate lending activities. This is what I was saying. Is this the right market to look for importance of types of information? Yes, is this the market of relationship lending as we know it? Yes, is there any role of discretion? Yes, and I'm going to suggest you to look at a paper, which I already discussed as well. It was, it's a Janet Gauss paper from Indiana, Do Loan Officers Impact Lending Decisions? This is a paper also about what? Availability of credit and interest rate in the syndicated loan market, okay? Again, what here, what they try to do is they, what they try to do is, uh, what Manuel tried to do is shed some light on how information production is collected and used in bank lending decisions. And the paper title, this is a little uh, of a joke, but maybe no one, like, again, the paper is about humans. Yes, but there's no humans in the paper. There's not even loan officer fixed effects. There's no one. I don't think they have the data. Okay, if they have the data, that would be basically fantastic. Okay, so what's their main result? Let me tell you them in one line. I think Manuel explained it super clearly. So variation in interest rates in excess of what internal models suggest provides limited information for predicting defaults. And this provides support to the idea that all information is pricing in hard information. And this is when I'm going to start thinking less, like maybe we have to tone it down a bit. The authors claim that virtually all credit relevant information used in bank lending to corporate borrowers in the US is hard model based. 
we have to be very careful with these statements when only one dimension is explored. Financial contracts, maybe soft information is used for what? For covenants. Maybe soft information is used for other elements, like other elements of a financial contract. So we have to be very careful with, it, with policy implications. Okay? That's when I say the difficult task of the paper is going to be to set it in the, in the big picture. Where does it fit? Not to make it only a banking paper about how soft affects what? How soft affect basically uh, interest rates. I'm not going to say anything about uh, like the empirical strategy. I'm not going to say, I have nothing to say about that. Okay? Let me tell you three general comments and then some specific comments. Okay? Some general comments, big picture. Yes? So can we do more in exploring the economic mechanism of the incentives that loan officers have to collect information in these banks? I want you to understand this is not the regional bank. This is not the bank around the corner. These are the monster banks. Okay? These are 33 monster banks. Their mega banks are more than 250 billion. billion okay? So then the other thing, I know it's a first draft. The motivation of the paper is very unclear. Is it about opaqueness, large versus small? Uh, the borrowers? Is it about uh, organizational structure banks, large versus small? Now, Manuel, Manuel was very careful and when he presented, he had not much to say here. Yes, there's nothing to say about large versus small. Okay? Is it about screening versus monitoring? Yes, maybe soft information matters for the screening side and not for the monitoring side. Yes, and that's when I say, what is the real paper about? This is basically what I think you should spend in the first two pages. Yes, is the paper about organizational design of lending? Is it a, is the paper about centralization or decentralization of decisions? Yes, and remember, they have a very difficult task. What's the very difficult task? They don't observe humans. There is an inference out of interest rate if you want differential. Soft information is not really observed, and the complete information set is not observed. Okay, so this is they have this task. With this very difficult task, okay. Now, what I think they might do. So now I'm going to go to the specific comments. Okay. Maybe explain a little bit more, at least I still have problems in understanding what. Something, you're going to see that all this is about my definition of soft information. Yes? What are the internal ratings telling us about? If you believe one thing, then the paper flies. If you don't believe something, you're going to see what you basically, like what's the main assumption you have to believe. Okay? Then, and then what? Clarify some economic considerations, and then if I have time, I'll talk about other issues. Okay? These are, this is one slide of other issues. So, what is their main assumption? Yes. The assumption is that a model, yes, just think of an internal model of a bank. Yes, just think of internal models of banks. I'm going to show you one internal model of a bank. They claim that what? Deliver rating solely using hard information. And then the loan officer uses this rating and soft information to set the interest rate. Is this assumption realistic? Yes. If you believe this, the paper flies. Is this where soft information matters or not? Where does soft information feature in this, set, in this setting? So let's assume that the model drives rating and price. Then the rating explains pricing, fine. But pricing does not explain delinquency once we control for rate. This doesn't rule out soft information. But rather implies that the rating and price are maybe both of them sufficient statistics for one another. So this is the first thing, okay? That's why I have nothing to say about what they did empirically. It's all about the interpretation and how you put it, like, like how you set it up. Is soft information used and an input to the price? Yes, and this is me, of course. You can believe it or not. Not always that it should matter for these loans. This is not a person going to ask for one loan. This is a what? This is the CFO of a company, McDonald's, going to ask the in Citibank, create facilities. So they do very well, very careful on the data. They sum the loans, they collapse them at the facility level. This is where, where I was saying, if soft information is used to screen right covenants or decide how to monitor, but not send the interest rate, then I would expect their finding because they are looking for some information where? In the wrong place. But then the result is correct, but the interpretation is what? The interpretation, I, I put, maybe I'm too hard, wrong. The interpretation is what? It basically is misleading. Yes. I think you have to write the lending technology that you have in your mind. Like, you know, say, okay, what's the, lending, like, like, what's, the, like, what's the lending technology? Once you can explain and convince the reader that the lending technology, yes, this is what we are thinking about, then we can start thinking about it. Why? Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to what? To interpret, basically, like, like to interpret the results. So, this is what I was saying. Uh, now, how to interpret the findings? 
authors do not observe self-information, so they infer it from a regression of hard price on hard information rating, and then look at the relation between rating and perform. You need to assume, this is what you need to assume. If you believe this, the, 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 everything flies. They need to assume that the price, the interest rate, has soft information. Yes? Remember, they cannot test soft information on the four. Yes? If soft information is not reflected in the price, then they cannot infer anything from running what? Delinquency on rating and price. Yes? And the other thing, that maybe this is a cheap comment, but I have to say something about identification. At the end of the day, what they are looking is what? Is a rating precision. What is good precision? There's no counterfactual. What is basically good relative to what? What is the counterfactual? That's when you're going to see that all my next comments are trying to make you find cross-sectional or time series variation. You need to find maybe a time period where proprietary information is more important, where soft information is more important. You need some time series or cross-sectional variation. You don't have the, the cross-sectional variation on what? On banks, because all the banks are what? Are extremely what? Basically, they are extremely large. Okay. So let me say one more thing about this rating. Yes, this is what I was saying. Remember their assumption. Their rating is hard information. You have, they have, I think, 33 banks, if I remember correctly. If I remember correctly. Imagine the internal model of each of these banks. Yes, and they claim ah, that's only based on hard information because that throws a probability of the fault. I know then they match it to the SMB. Okay, so look at, so I, I so I went to a, a very particular bank. Everyone knows which bank it is, I think. Yes. So you go to one bank. Yes. This is one bank. Yes. Again, not corporate lending, but it's basically what? Medium lending. And what do you see? This is the internal model. Yes. All this is the internal model. Yes. What I wanted to see is what? Look within that internal model. There's hard information, but there's also what? Company and personal legal history. Company and personal legal check-ins. Uh, quality and reliance of information provided there, okay? So again, the point, we need to be very careful in and trying to understand what, what is this rating model? Yes. We need to really spend time, even what, I know you construct this probability, like, like probability of default, yes, but we need to be very sure that the what? Their, their test lies on what? You have a, a model that relies on hard. Interest rate relies on hard and soft. So everything is what? If you believe that, everything flows. But you need to convince the reader on what? Okay? That is it like, is like, do we believe that internal models do not have what? Any input of a loan officer, okay? So this is what, this was what? This was about the rating and the model. So now let me tell you some economic considerations, okay? So first, this is after reading the paper. This, is this the natural setting to ask this question? Again, maybe it's a cheap comment, but do we expect U.S. corporate loans? This is inside these approvals. You have a syndicated part as well. Let's say you have a facility, you have a syndicated part of McDonald's. How much city has of McDonald's? Okay. Is this where they were? Is this where they say, I think it's much more about hard information, accounting statements, good, trade information, collateral registries. Yes. So it's unclear the paper, the reasons for similar results for large and small banks. Then you, when you start reading more and diving more, well, it makes sense. Why? They're only talking about what? They're talking only about very, like very, very big what? Basically very, very borrowers, yes? This is something I didn't understand about the data. Yes, that it would be nice maybe for you to study. So you, in these trust tests, you also have the individual borrowers. So these individual borrowers, yes, and they said like they, they filter them out, which makes sense to filter them out, but they have a rating as well. It would be interesting to understand, okay, how is the rating of those individual borrowers or what? Yes, good. basically, how are they constructed? Do they have a rating? Yes, what does it mean in your data, individual borrowers? I know you basically eliminated them, yes? Now, let me go to competition for borrowers. Yes, so assume this is something they did not explore. Maybe they don't have the data. Assume that borrowers can go to multiple banks and compete on price. Hence, the prices might all converge to the rating, hard information. So information would be used then what? Maybe to screen, to monitor, to set that covenants, but not what, but price. We just compete for what? We just compete for price. Can the authors examine single versus multiple relations? Yes. Maybe in multiple relations, you can use within borrower deviation across lenders to detect proprietary soft information. Yes. Remember, 
it's very hard to argue about organizational design and the statements you make. Remember, it's a first draft, exploring only pricing. Why? Because there are other elements of a what? Of a financial contract where what? Where maybe soft information matters. Okay. Let me say two more things, and I think I'm going to be on time. Yes. So remember, this is very, very important, especially if you have not worked with banking data. Yes. We're very accustomed to say, ah, one loan, one loan, one loan. They don't have one loan. But these are large, these are large facilities. Yes. The average is 25 million. Yes. The 25% to 3 million. Yes. Again, it would be very nice to what? To understand what are, what are the information asymmetries that would, re economically, that would require in this setup, corporate lending, soft information in large banks and corporate loan market. Yes. Uh, and clear, this is something important, I think. And clear that one loan officer is making the decision within the same bank. Maybe this is, I remember, this is not one individual loan. If you would have loan officer fixed effects, that would be very, very useful. If you want to tell a story about what? This is when the paper is very convoluted. In the, in the introduction, they talk about discretion, but there's no rule. Like, again, like it would be very nice to, what, to have this loan officer fixed effects. I don't think they have that data. The problem you're going to have is as soon as you put loan officer fixed effects, you're going to be in basically what? In Janice Gauss' territory of syndicated loan markets. Yes, but I rem remember, fixed effects is also what? It's, all, it's also another black box. Okay? And let me say, let me say one more thing, two more things. Yes. So I was trying to think about what? I was trying to try to think about finding variation where soft information is more important to try to understand when is this interest rate maybe more important. So technological innovations and information sharing mechanism affect the cost of collecting and producing information. So I started thinking in the time series. When is information more important? Yes. Not, not the hard information. When is the soft information more important? Yes. Again, information easily disseminated may have a punishment effect inducing loan, officer, e e e loan officers to exert higher effort. This is an argument much more of small business lending, but they are going to likely impact the production function of the loan officer to collect what? To collect different types of information. So I know you don't have it a long time time series, but can changes in the informational environment may have impacted differentially the collection of information across basically like the relative use of, of hard and soft information and trying to find some sort of what? Time series variation in order to move what? To move the importance of that component of that, that, uh, that these interest rates. And the last slide, other issues. Uh, these are minor things. When you weigh the interest rates on disperse things, what did you do with the committed parts? Uh, maybe try to rather than divide large versus small study non-parametrically the banks is there a differential effect of each bank yes it's almost data mining to be honest it's like just what put each bank and start seeing is there is there more information of it like of each bank or not yes why don't you explore the credit availability dimension yes and something minor you tell me the story about negative sales growth i don't think that's a measure for a for a mcdonald's for for a ford Yes, this is basically, again, it makes sense maybe for a private company. It, it, like, it looks out of the blue why basically we use, ah, let's use, instead of delinquency, let's use basically negative sales growth. Yes, the conclusion is a very nice descriptive analysis, very difficult, extremely difficult to do it. Yes, on the importance of having information in pricing of loans, you need to motivate better the setting. Why is this the natural, why is this the natural laboratory to study this? Yes. The paper could benefit more, benefit a bit more with what? Tightening the economic motivation, helping the reader interpret models. Yes. If you are not into this world, what, like what is this model? Are this model only really hard information? Yes. And the discussion of economic considerations on loan officers. And much more important, you mentioned in the introduction, what type of banking system we will have in the future. You claim it's all relative to hard. Remember, you're studying one dimension. You need to think about all the dimensions to make these policy implications. So that's it. Looking forward to read the next version. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jose, for this uh, very rich discussion. It's a lot of points in there. So, Manuel, would you like to pick one or two to respond to, so we still have some time Absolutely. for a question so, or two? Let me let me thank Jose. Thank you for for a careful reading. Um, I agree with with many of the points you make. Um, let me just say just on one point, and and I and, I, and there. Uh, I think the, the, the main, like a big comment that I take away is, 
other than you made very good points on the empirics that we need to think about. But indeed, all we can, we can only say something about pricing over here. We cannot and we shouldn't say, and, and indeed, it seems like the writing needs to be tightened over there. It is, we, we should not be making points about lending decisions, or we, we are not making points about lending decisions or covenants. This is indeed about pricing more than anything else. Um, and it's only about pricing. And that needs to be completely clear. And, and, and then when you, when, you, when, you, when you said, we then need to decide what kind, of, um, what kind of banking system are we gonna have in the future, we need to be careful about those policy implications. I agree completely with all of those points. Uh, I wanna think harder about the point, um, the points about counterfactuals. We don't have a counterfactual. Um, and you're right, and you said it, that's absolutely true. You need to buy something about whether, whether there is soft information in interest rates and the model of interest rate setting to then, for, for then for our exercise to make, to make sense. And you said it exactly right. You do need those assumptions. Um, so again, thank you. The comments very well taken.